buffet friends, Jack Prince offers many finishing options like laminating. Protect your project with plastic, heat sealed lamination. Lamination adds a professional aesthetic and keeps paper protected from various elements or extensive wear. Think of laminated VIP passes. Oh, and you know the COT is always treated like VIP over at the JP. Choose the option that meets your needs. Available in gloss, matte, or satin finishes. You can get a flushed edge or, or an edge seal. Choose your desired thickness. Jack Prince has many finishing options. One is just right for your next project or your client's project. JackPrince.com slash Circle of Trust. Hey, don't hate, laminate. Hey, friends, when you hear that sound, ah, that means it's Thunder King going down my mouth hole. You can head over to thunderkingbrewing.com and to see the thunders hitting me and enjoy delicious Thunder King cold brew coffee at your home. Regardless, if you don't live here in Southern California, you can order the Black Coffee Six Pack, aka the Long Boys, Black Gold Nitrogen Concentrate, aka the 8 ounce Baby Wolverines, or you can just get the organic small batch coffee beans sent to your door and make your own Mm, delicious Thunder King because I know you like the DIY. You want to do it yourself? We'll do it with thunderkingbrewing.com. When you check out A-I-D-C-O-T at checkout and you'll save some. Thunder King! When you hear that sound, there's lightning going down. Coming to you live from the Saul Rosenberg Studios... Broadcasting worldwide into all ships at sea, here comes another action-packed episode of Adventure in Design. Hello, Cheekies. Hello, Twin Sparrows. Hello, Mr. Lions. A shout-out to Palm Springs, because I'm back, baby. I'm your host, Mark Bricky. And I'm back from vacation and ready to do it all over again. What do you say we drop into the world of Lorna Brown on today's Adventure in Design 581? Coworkers, I am back. Did you miss me? I actually missed you. I thought about you. I thought a lot about work while I was on my vacation. My wife and I, we went away for our anniversary. It seems that 10 years of marriage have completely just zipped by on one hand it has on the other hand it just feels like it's been a lifetime since i met beth and was completely lost met her 14 years ago uh two years three years later on the that very date that we'd meet may 12th i'd say hey let's get married well i was smart i live a life of design that was on a friday and i knew that if we uh could get married a year later that we could get married on a saturday so therefore our first date, blind date, our, our engagement and our wedding date, all May 12th, 14 years total, 10 years married. And man, oh man, has it been a journey and it is just awesome how much she has changed me and vice versa, how much I have changed her. We are literally two entirely different people because of the life that we've had together and the way that we have influenced one another. And I would say that it has been so easy to be her husband, her fiance, and her boyfriend. It's been very, very easy. It's been effortless. In fact, it kind of made me realize, oh, yeah, all those other relationships were hard or difficult or stressful because they weren't supposed to be. This one, 28 days out of the month, is effortless. Okay, we went to a place called Twin Sparrows Lodge in Palm Springs. Really, really nice, affordable, tiny resort uh, right off the side of the highway. It's very understated. No type on their sign, just two little birds on a branch. So, you know, the design aesthetics where we need it. Small rooms that feel like a cabin. Nice design. All the rooms in the front half open up to a, a modest sized pool. And there's a barn in the middle where you can get your, your food and drinks from. And then on the back side, there's chill horseshoes, a community dining area, fire pit in the evenings you know, life-size Jenga, you know, made out of like blocks the size of bricks. It's really, really chill. We've gone out there before. We've gone to the Ace Hotel. It's overrun by hipsters. Uh, and the hipsters love to smoke the cigarettes. I can't stand the, the secondhand smoke. 
and the hipsters have started having children. And the interesting thing about hipsters are is they're not very well behaved. So their children are the worst behaved children. And that takes away from a chill ass vacation of sitting in the desert, staring at a mountain next to a pool for as many hours as you can handle if you're pale tattooed like myself. We also went to the Parker out there. Uh, it's a little, little high end, you know, we can uh, afford to stay there, but it doesn't feel like we belong to stay there. We got to see people do cocaine around a fire at night, and we got to see a girl change her outfit like 12 times because she had 9 million Instagram followers and clearly was at the Parker to promote. But the Sparrow, the, the two Sparrow Lodge we went to, the, the price was right. The chill was right. The vibe was right. And we observed something as we love to observe. We're, we're lurkers at heart. The Brickies, the Brickleys love to lurk. We saw many, many pregnant couples out at Palm Springs this weekend. Because in California, there's something called a baby moon. And the baby moon, as interpreted by today's youngsters, is you and your wife, you go away. On one last little honeymoon, one last little trip to enjoy time with each other before the disruption of your child shows up in your lap. Now, I researched the baby moon because it seemed odd. The current interpretation of the baby moon is completely wrong. The hipsters are doing it wrong. I'm telling you right now, they're doing it wrong. The baby moon was originally designed where mommy and daddy and baby go away on a trip They get away from all the outside influences of their life, jobs, responsibilities of a home. You go on a trip, mommy, baby, and daddy, and you bond as a family. They're doing it wrong. They're bonding as a couple before the kid comes in and disrupts their life. Oh, the place where we stayed at, one of the reasons why I loved it, it was 21 and over. No young partiers, no children, just people that wanted to chill. But then when I had to look at all these pregnant folks everywhere, pregnant couples, I'm like, You're kind of breaking the rules. It's 21 and over, and you're carrying in a child. You're reminding me of the process. Nah, who cares? I'm just old and stubborn, whatever. Want to give a shout out to this place in Palm Springs, if you ever go there, called uh, Cheekies. The best chilaquiles you'll ever have. If you haven't had chilaquiles, get on it. One of the best breakfasts you'll ever have. I love the Mexican food. And I also want to give a shout out to Mr. Lyons. I'm not endorsed by these places, but Mr. Lyons, if in Palm Springs, What a steak and even better mashed potatoes. Palm Springs is a perfect place for the designer to go because it's in a city that has thought process behind it. They decided they wanted to make something worthy and something that would be worthwhile. A city with an identity, mid-century, modern design, everywhere you look. And I grew up in a neighborhood where there was like four or five different house designs. They built them as cheap, as quick. And, and efficiently as possible. My neighborhood had no rhythm to it. It had no vibe. To walk, get up early every morning and to take our dog on a walk through these neighborhoods and look at the way that community design can be, the way a neighborhood can have such elegant design of these flat, modern uh, ranch homes where you don't even see any windows. Many of them Very, very white or or just creek rock with just a brightly colored orange or turquoise door. There's something about when everything around you is designed in a way where it matches. Not matches like a track home where there's four different designs of where I came from, but everything is at the same intelligence of design. I absolutely love it. If you're ever looking for a place to go, I highly recommend Palm Springs. All of these resorts have taken old roadside motels, hotels, and, and really gone through them with, with a hip sense of design, uh, splashes of color. And it, it, for a creative person, it really is a tremendous place to go to clear your mind. And the thing that I love about a chill vacation is it gave me time to think about my own script for success. Talk about that a lot on the show. And Thursday, we released an episode that I would recommend you go back and listen to. It'd be AID 579 with Billy Ballman and myself, chasing clients, or are you chasing you? And as I released that episode from my vacation, it made me think about that mission and how it reflects to me. 
And I spent my vacation wondering, who is it that I really want to be? Because I've kind of gotten pretty close to what my target used to be. So what's the next evolution? What's the next 20 years of all this look like? And how do I want to get there? There's, there's, there's many ways to get to where you want to get in this life. So I realized on this break, it was time for me to reevaluate my game plan. And I tell you, the best thing about a vacation and why you can't afford to not take one, even if it's just going to a tent in the woods, which I would never do, but maybe it's in your budget. And I'm not, that's not like a money thing. I just, I don't believe in camping. It's, it's not what I'm supposed to be doing for me. Camping is, is a hotel, but distance helps you see everything in such a clear way. And there's so many ways to get to where you want to be. There's so many ways to become the person that you want to be. And I moved up today's interview because I just did it last week. And I got a queue of really great interviews. The Shepherd Ferry interview has been cleared. So that will be coming out very soon. But I wanted to move this one up because it matched sort of what we talked about last week on, are you really at the heart of it all? Are you chasing clients and jobs and invoices? Or should you be chasing you? And when you really find who you are, there's a way where it's like a key that opens up the universe and all of these blessings start to fall into your lap. And then you're on that good momentum. And then people that are confused, look at you like, you know, all the answers and you only know one answer, who you are and what makes that person happy. So I moved this interview up because today's guest is the walking British talking skateboarding embodiment of that notion. She did it all right. She did it the way you're supposed to. She went to university. She got trained at her craft, scientific and natural history, illustration, painting. Lorna got jobs, got clients, got an agent, but she never found happiness. She felt lost at her career that she'd worked so hard to get. So then she got really lost and took a detour into the world of roller derby. And then she got even more lost. She heard a calling. An opportunity popped up. She said, for whatever reason, this is scary, but she is someone who embraces her fears. She doesn't walk away. She leans into what scares her. So she found herself in Palestine teaching young girls and young women how to skateboard. I don't know if she would say this, but obviously she was also teaching them Western feminism. That's my word. So don't get mad, Lorna. I'm just looking at it from an outsider's perspective of what it is that you are doing. And when she went out there on this wild mission to teach children in a war-torn area of the world how to find the art of skateboarding and the empowerment and inspiration that comes from skateboarding, relatively a new thing in this part of the world. When she went out there and learned how to care for others, it taught her how to care for herself. And right now, she's living the book that she's writing and painting. And I literally mean that. She is out on an advance, exploring the globe, painting, illustrating, and writing this adventure. We caught her right in the middle of it, right where she wants to be, living the life that she wants. And my question is, are you? Listen, learn, and fall in love with the free spirit that is Lorna Brown. See her work and follow her adventures at Lorna Stration. At Lorna Stration. It's like Lorna, an illustration without the illo, just the stration. Let's dive in and meet our new best friend, Lorna Brown. I'm very, very well, and it's very sunny. It is sunny. That's why it's California. <laughs> That's why I'm here. I've been to the cloud that you call home. Uh, and I was like, wow, this is this is different. But I'm I'm looking forward to getting back to California and realize why my British friends love coming over here so much. So we didn't bring you on the show to talk about the weather. You wrote me and said, hey, I'm going to be headed out to California. And at the end of your very nice, well thought out pitch to be on the show, you said, I know that I'm not at the level of some of your other guests, but what the hell? Mm -hmm. But it's not about the level that people are at. It's about, or level that they're known at, it's the life experience and the story and the way that it relates to the audience. 
and I think today we've got a very, very relatable conversation to have. One that I know that I can uh, really relate with because I think where your life really sort of took off creatively or being fulfilling, I'm guessing, we'll, we'll, I'll learn uh-huh. as, we, as we chat, is one summer trying to avoid the real world, I decided to go teach art at a summer camp. Uh-huh. And I didn't realize this, but teaching art at a summer camp and then getting my first dog, I didn't realize that the way to really learn how to care for yourself is to learn how to care for other people. Uh, yep. Do you get what I'm saying? I totally get it. Yeah. And when I saw that life by chance had taken you around the world to teach skateboarding to, to, to folks. Mm-hmm. Not chance, choice choice but your yep. choice but yep. the world the world yes. gave you that chance yeah and you chose to take it where did you end up for your teaching i ended up in palestine with an organization called skate pal uh teaching skateboarding to uh kids and women in uh just north of nablus in palestine all right i hear palestine i hear mm-hmm. go the other way I've, I've been trained as a white American watching the news that that's what we call a hot spot on the planet. Yeah. What year did you go to Palestine? Uh, last year, 2016. Oh, shit. So it was red hot when you went there. How was it? How much of that is fictionalized? One of the main reasons I wanted to go. Okay. So something about me, I, um, I feel a lot of fear in my life. Mm -hmm. And I run at it headfirst. And so I felt like the media was telling us to be afraid of Islam, be afraid of Muslim people, be afraid of this part of the world. As a woman, do not travel there. And I thought I have this opportunity to go there and see for myself. And so that's exactly what I did. And then it changed my life. Which most things that scare you when you go after them. You, you are different afterwards. You faced your fear. There's so many people right now that aren't doing what they want to do. They're not who they want to be because of a little voice in the back of their head. And it's like, well, but what if, what if you just go do it? What if you live through it? So now I feel like a a complete jerk off that just five minutes ago, I'm like, well, if you go to Tijuana, (laughs) be careful. That that is why I left. (laughs) You've been to fucking Palestine. Look, you know what? Let me change my advice to you. Go to Tijuana, and I want to suggest maybe go at 1 a.m. Yep, never yep. see the sun in Tijuana. Be, be the only woman I know that's been there only in moonlight hours. High five strangers is the way to get through life. So when you go to Palestine and you're teaching children and women how mm-hmm. to skateboard, first off, let me just get the stereotypes out on the table. Are we talking about people that are wearing like desert fashion? Like, you know, skateboarding, you need tight trousers on you need maybe shorts even though i don't endorse it you need shorts on like are we talking about people that are wearing desert robes on a skateboard because that sounds dangerous to me uh no you're not not within um this particular community okay um the women um and older girls were wearing hijab uh but that was the rest of it was kind of normal clothes and that as one, we would wear that one covers just the hair not the face just the hair yes because you're going to need yeah. your eyesight if you're skateboarding yes yeah just the hair yeah not the face uh we didn't uh, the female teachers didn't have to but we were advised to cover our elbows and knees um just to kind of fit in with local yeah. uh local custom um and i wore a cap so uh which the kids loved taking off because i had pretty crazy hair at the time right, and then right. they'd laugh at me Children are absolutely just the world's greatest people. I don't know how children become adults. Something happens <laughs> in the middle there. Well, actually, I do know. Children are the mo- the world's most amazing people. Adults suck, but teenagers really suck. So there's just <laughs> something in the middle there where you go too far and then you kind of come back. So being with children and them having zero filter and just enjoying the moment for what it was, what were some of the things that you heard from these kids that you realized that you really were like, you might've thought, well, I'll just go there and you know, Mm -hmm. it it won't change me, but I'm sure the kids probably just without even knowing told you things are like, I could go fucking cry right now. Yeah. There were definitely quite a few moments like that where we, it 
for me, it was when the children would overcome their fear of dropping in or rolling down a bank or just skating for the first time. Yeah. And the language barrier was quite problematic. And the, the kids didn't speak very much English. I had some knowledge of Arabic, which I'd learned beforehand, but not, not fluent by any means. Sure. But the sparkle and joy in someone's eyes, that felt universal. And yeah. that was what I wasn't expecting. Right. I right. guess. And I think when you do these things, you have an expectation of, you know, before you go on any trip in your mind's eye, you're like, it'll probably be this way. And we make stupid goals, right? Like when I go there, I'm going to read a lot. And then you get there, you get caught up in the moment and it goes the way that it's supposed to go. Right. And you get yeah. these influences that you never even expected. Kind of. I, I didn't research very much beforehand at all sure. in order to prevent having any uh, preconceptions. Yeah. So there were other volunteers that I knew had written blogs with photos and video diaries. And I was like, I could watch this, but I, I just want the filters off. I want to see this all fresh, kind of clean eyes and experience it completely without even thinking about it. And I guess I was a bit scared. So I was a bit head in the sand and I only booked my flight two weeks before I was meant to be going because <laughs> I was thinking, oh, maybe if I break my leg at the skate park, then I won't have to do it. But right. Right. So was there, was there any scary or shady shit that went down? I mean, you're in Palestine last year. Mm -hmm. I mean, gunfire, bombs going off. I mean, any of that shit or did it just feel like you were in London? Um, in Palestine itself, I felt uh, pretty safe, particularly yeah. in the um, the areas that weren't mixed, uh, because you, I felt very, very welcomed within the community. I mean, I saw someone shooting a gun out of a car next to the skate park, and we saw some jets dropping stuff, kind of military jets dropping stuff over the fields next to the skate park. But Honestly, most of the problems I had were within the kind of the occupying forces um, and kind of witnessing how the Palestinians are treated. Yeah. And that that was really hard to yeah. deal with, but quite important because otherwise you could just believe you're in any other country in the world. And that where you saw them treated unfairly, was that mm -hmm. by Israelis? Yes, it was. Okay. So you yeah. probably have, because over here, we're pretty much trained to be on the side of the Israelis and mm -hmm. the, the Palestines are the, are the, the villains in this, you know, war that's been going on since it feels like the beginning of time for us that are in our thirties and forties, but you probably have a very different read on that now. Yeah, um, I do, but I am also aware that I was viewing the whole conflict from one point of view. Sure. And so I, I saw people, particularly old, it really got to my heart when I saw old women being uh, degraded at checkpoints. And when one of my taxis was turned away from uh, getting into the city I needed to go to for no reason at all and had to take another 30 mile detour, all by people with heavily armed. Um, and so that felt like this powerlessness within the community. Sure. Um, but I also made sure I skated with the Jerusalem skater girls while I was there to hear some of the other side of what it's like to be a young woman in Israel and sure. how um, they're using skateboarding to help unify the community of Jerusalem. And that was incredibly inspiring as well. And so uh, I am aware that I don't have the full side from the from the Israeli side. I just always like asking somebody that's been to the point of conflict and mm -hmm. has a much better, much fair and balanced read of what they saw. Were you able to spend much time in Israel? Like I hear that that part of the world is absolutely beautiful. It's, it, it was incredibly beautiful. I'd say Jerusalem was one of the most beautiful cities I've ever been. To. I would hope so. If they're going to fight about it for <laughs> this long, it better be fucking. Like, nobody's going to fight for Cleveland like they're fighting for fucking Jerusalem. So um, the skate park in Jerusalem is amazing. Really? It's just incredible. Really? But I felt my heart was so treated so much nicer and more welcomed on the other side of the border in the Palestinian cities, uh, wherever I was in the kind of from Hebron to Bethlehem to Nablus, 
people would go out of their way, especially if you spoke a little bit of Arabic to them, people would go out of the way to help you and close their shop to show you where somewhere is down the road. And yeah, it was just so welcoming. You're pretty pale. You're, you're pretty blonde. <laughs> Your eyes are pretty blue. I mean, you're not going to fit in whatsoever. So right out of the gate, people would understand that you were there for something other than just living there, correct? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All right. So this is a question I have for you. When I got into skateboarding, changed my life. I really owe skateboarding to be in that first step and to the subculture, to the underground. You know, I'm 42. I got into it in 1984. And it just, you know, I was 10 years old and it, it just changed my whole life. I will always be different because of skateboarding. Uh, there was a thing that was very hard for me to understand. I could not understand why none of the girls in my community would hop on the skateboard. I couldn't understand. Like, this thing is so much fun. Go ahead. Get on it. I'll hold you up. I'll show you how it works. Like, all the weight should be on your front leg. And when you push, just lean on that front leg and you're good to go. No, no, no. And you just, I had a fantasy of like, if your girlfriend was in a skateboarding and you're in a skateboarding, life is fucking grand. <laughs> but there was something in all of their minds that told them no. So what in your head as a young girl said, get on this thing and make it yours? Like where other women said no, why did you say yes? Oh, um, because it looked fun and I've, I've never let other people's expectations tell me what to do. Right on. To the level of, I guess, going to Palestine or <laughs> kind of <laughs> facing my fears, yeah. but also uh, being quite contrary. So, I mean, a lot of my skateboarding friends growing up drank a lot, maybe smoked a bit of weed. And I didn't go anywhere near that because I was counterculturing the counterculture. And right. To the kind of straight edge degree. I mean, <laughs> preaching to the choir. Over here. I, think I, just, I think I just cried a little bit. So you just were like, I'm going to do this. Nobody's going to tell me not to. What, mm -hmm. a, what a great attitude, though, going back to Palestine in our conversation of you've got young women. I'm going to go ahead and stereotype again because I'm actually, I find out I'm very good at it. Mm -hmm. You've got young women growing up in an area where it feels to me that the cards are just stacked against women in that region due to their religion and the way that it's constructed. Maybe you can tell me differently. My, my, I will, I marched in San Francisco against the travel ban. Like I believe Muslims should be able to come here. I believe refugees should be able to come here. That being said, because you, it's okay to have problems with people, even though yeah. you accept them, you can have problems. I don't like the way that I see women treated. Mm -hmm. And so you're showing a young girl who at some point in time, the rules are going to be very different for her than young men. You're showing her how to do this thing that's considered to be pretty masculine. Like, were they just ready to dive in, drop in and take it as their own? Or did you have to kind of work them like you would in the US that, hey, you can do this too? I think when we were there, skateboarding was so new that we were kind of, as an organization, they were pushing the idea that it wasn't just for men. Right on. And so there wasn't that heavily male influence. Got it. However, when it was set up, um, the reason why they needed female volunteers as well as male volunteers uh, was because the community said only women can teach women and only men can teach men. And however, by and that's how they started it out. Yeah. However, by the time I got there several months later after the skate park had been built, um, that had changed completely and I could teach boys, the male teachers could teach the girls. It was much more relaxed wow. and the community had just accepted it as a form of play for the kids. Wow. So you guys influenced the community beyond the sport? Um, we did. However, that wasn't the intention. Sure. Sure. Yeah. But I mean, that's, yeah. the, what, that's what, that's the beauty. That though. was the result of it. Yeah. That's the beauty of putting people together that aren't supposed to be together. You know, yes. you're going to get something new from that sort of jazz, you know, everybody mm -hmm. kind of doing their own thing, like something new is going to come out of it. Yeah. So you go there, you do all of this, mm -hmm. but before this, you were an illustrator. You went to school. You're a trained illustrator. Yeah. I was trained in scientific and natural history illustration. Okay. Uh, what pretty, the fuck does that mean? <laughs> it's, it was a dying art. <laughs> it was kind of photorealistic okay. illustration, uh, meshing together science and art, which okay. was 
kind of something that appealed to me um, and giving us a heavy training in uh, real painting techniques. It was like com the computer was quite frowned upon and it was super old techniques that, I mean, the course stopped existing a couple of years after I finished, I think, because yeah. it was obsolete. But I'm so grateful for that grounding in actual painting. I think, I don't know how old you are, and I've been told by doing this never to ask a lady her age. So I'm going to assume that we're not too far off. Maybe there's 10 years between us. But I think an interesting thing for creatives of, of our age is that many of us were, like I was in the very last class of um, you know commercial art or whatever it was called uh, at the time. I can't think of the term right now. But I was in the last class, like literally the last you know way that they did it. And then I was also in the first of the new. So I mm -hmm. think because of technology, many of us either trained in something that doesn't exist anymore or we were in that first, you know, ship out of the port where nobody really knew how to teach it or what was going on. But I, one of the things that I liked about your story is that I have sort of a, a, a theory that moving forward in technology or in the creative arts that, you know, if you're just a, a layman in creativity, if you're just your regular graphic designer that can kind of do all the fundamentals. I don't know how much longer there's going to be a quality job for you. I feel like that we're moving into a world where the more specialized you are, the better of a chance that you have to, to save yourself a spot. And I know that you said that in that when the recession hit in 2007, you're just like, what the fuck am I doing here? Yeah. When the recession hit, I, uh, a few of my clients that owed me quite a bit of money went bankrupt. And so I had, big chunks of money owing to me. And I'd gone down this weird path of, I straight out of university, I got a really shitty agent who <laughs> I thought they were on my side. I, I, the industry was changing so much. Sure. My um, degree wasn't really relevant anymore. Sure. I thought I'll use someone else's skills in the industry and hopefully they'll guide me on a new path. And they just tried to channel me into whatever they had, whatever work they had coming in. And so I was producing work for their clients they had that was speculative, that I'd only get paid if the client chose that work. Oh. And it was it was just awful. And yeah. my self-esteem and self-confidence was at an all-time low because they weren't trying to make me the best me. They were just trying to earn some money out of me. Right. Um, and so then I, I left them uh, under a black cloud. And then I went on my own for a bit and ended up in this weird world of kind of twee greetings card, book, magazine, illustration. And it just didn't feel authentic. I didn't feel like I was saying anything and I was kind of earning, I was earning a bit of money from it. Um, Is this the type so, of work you have to do very, very quickly? Uh. Yeah. A couple of days. Yeah. Yeah. So you can't really invest yourself in it. You're following other people's gu guidelines. You just kind of feel like a tool. Yeah. I felt like a tool. Yeah. <laughs> Both ways, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And I tried to defend, I don't know. It just felt like it didn't have any meaning. It wasn't making the world better. It wasn't saying anything about the world. It wasn't expressing anything of me. It was just me painting for money. And I got quite stressed about that. Uh, and so I decided- But it was to also go, you painting for shit money? Question mark? Uh, no, it was pretty good money. Okay. It was okay money. Oh, well, now that changes my opinion. <laughs> Uh, I can easily be persuaded with money over here, okay? <laughs> it was okay money, but I found myself getting stressed about it. Right. So I'm not sure it was worth the stress. The stress was coming from the restrictions, the the guidelines, the amount of time allowed? Like The stress was coming from, I guess, me not painting what I wanted. Mm -hmm. And so every time I completed a brief, I felt like I had fluked it if it got passed. Right. And they regularly did get passed, but I just, it, yeah, it didn't feel what, like, like I compared to where I am now. It didn't feel like right. where I am now. Where, so you were restless. Yeah, restless. And then with people uh, owing, going bankrupt and owing me a lot of money, I 
got a bit lost in the industry and so um, then looked for other ways of making money. And the, uh, the meltdown of the economy fucked you over because companies that you were working for that owed you mm-hmm. money just vanished. Yes. Wow. Yeah. And see, that, that's kind of, I feel like if you're an industry, you know, worker, right? And, you know, the only thing worse than having no agent is having a shitty agent. <laughs> Word. <laughs> <laughs> I fucking know that. So the the landscape of that world is faster, quicker, get it done. You know, you're always tempted by money and you take on more than what you can because you don't know when things are going to happen. And the thing that I'm hearing here is like you just didn't like what you were doing. Fast forward right now to the woman that's sitting across from me. You're traveling the world on a book advance. Yeah. (laughs) You're making the type of work that you want to be making. Like right now, I'm going to go ahead and go out on a limb, but right now you are doing just like me right now. There's two people in a room. Mm -hmm. Each of them are doing their dream job. Yes. 100%. That's pretty fucking rad. Yeah. 100% of the people in this room are living (laughs) their dream. That that's rad. And you know, the advice that I said earlier is trying to be sort of the industry catch all. I don't know where that goes, but if you find your voice, find what you want to do, it at least leads to you, Mm. you know, and the work you're doing right now, it's beautiful work. Thanks. Very different. I'm, I'm an architectural illustrator as well. Mm -hmm. You've got uh, a really great sense of knowing how to cut it off. I want to keep adding on, keep adding on, keep adding on. Because I'm a guy and guys think people are <laughs> impressed by hard work and all this. Sh- I want to press them all because I'm a fucking dude. Look, how can I put it in there? Women are smarter than men. I know that's sexist, but you're like, you know what? This alley can end here. <laughs> and I look at your work. And I'm like, what a fucking asshole. It's just, I'm just going to walk away right here. And it makes more sense. It's actually better because you're not fitting it all in. So when you were on your quest, your skateboarding quest. Yep. Is that when you fell into the work that we're doing now? Uh, yes. When I was on my skateboarding quest every morning. I like how you just accepted that that's now the the term for it. Skateboarding quest. (laughs) My whole life is a quest. Um, when I was on that quest, uh, every morning, everyone else would get up and smoke and watch skate videos. And I would hold myself up in my little room and paint the buildings of Palestine. So the little market shop down the road, uh, the crazy, the apartheid wall, the uh, watchtowers, the uh, bus stops. I do, I try and do a painting a day when I wasn't traveling and um, sure. collecting reference. And These are based off of photographs? Yes. So when yeah. you're out around the town, you pull yeah. what, your iPhone out of your pocket? Uh, no, I took, uh, I had a little Samsung kind of camera. So you're With capturing throughout the day. Yep. And then when you're in your room, you're like, which one's kind of jumping out at me? And you try to paint it. Um, then when I get to the room, I will construct my buildings with perspective. So I'll run horizon lines, vanishing points, sometimes halfway across the room. So it makes sure. my uh, roommate uh, annoyed to come in. Um And then I'll construct it using the multiple reference. So never from one reference Uh, and then ink it and then paint it and try and get it done in one session on Mm. this trip. Mm. Uh, Two sessions is kind of, I'm still comfortable with two sessions. Paintings that take me three or four days, I reach this point of, despair and will is this going to work because i have to leave it and come back and so i've got to leave the zone of painting it sure to come back and i know i have to just push through that yeah in that case when you work on something for too long it's like there's this brain fog that comes over you where everything just feels like ah like everything feels heavy even though it's art supplies or in my case it's a fucking pencil on an ipad It just starts to feel heavy and clucky, even with editing audio, you know, and that's the moment like this needs to wrap up. You know, if I feel like I'm swimming in the work, it (laughs) needs to fucking wrap up. When you do your architectural paintings, there is a natural looseness to them Mm -hmm. that is consecutive throughout the whole body of work. How loose is too loose and how tight is too tight? How do you find that rhythm that is 
your signature look? I think the reason I like this, oh, I guess, style is because I'm not thinking about those choices. I'm. It's so not. So it's fluid. It's completely automatic. I'm not consciously thinking about those things when I'm painting. I'm. I'll pick which viewpoint is the best. But other than that, it's autopilot until I've done the last brush stroke and then it's finished. So all the thinking mm-hmm. goes in the setup. Yep. And then once you start digging the ditch, you're just. Just going. You're out there. Yeah. You're just relaxing. Time, you're out there. Time goes in these strange patterns. Food comes and goes. But yeah. Don't you think that's what makes something the dream job is that when you're in the moment of it. It is that losing time and perspective and a hundred percent. That's, that's when you were like, if I could, if somebody would just pay me to do this, I'd be real happy. <laughs> and that's exactly the same with skating. Yeah. That's why I think the two complement each other so well is like when I'm skating a bowl, the time disappears. When I'm painting a building, time disappears. When I'm smoking a bowl, that's- time disappears. <laughs> so connect the dots for me. Mm-hmm. We're on our skate quest. Yep. We start using our talents as a painter mm-hmm. to paint the landscape around you. Obviously, because you're in a once in a lifetime part of the world, you're just trying to collect all this culture that's so different than your own. How do we get to a book deal? Um, when I got back, uh, I had quite a good body of work, Palestine, and um, I have... I know someone that works for a publisher and they were looking at producing more illustrated books. And so we met and had coffee and she was, she was interested in the Palestine stuff, but I felt like the market for that wouldn't really be, wouldn't be big enough. I mean, Syria's the cool, the kind of the, the marketable place. If you want to be completely ruthless about the industry. Sure. Um, uh, so I felt like that wouldn't really be relevant. And prior to going to Palestine, I'd done uh, about 30 London coffee shops because just getting my hand in and uh, I like coffee. And so I just felt like it was a good subject. Oh, you matter. like coffee, but you fucking refuse it when I try to buy it for you. <laughs> you offered me Starbucks. <laughs> oh, come on. Come on. Snotty. Snotty. I'm out of the Thunder King. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I had a big body of work this, but, um, that also didn't feel like it fit. And so she told me to go away and think about any ideas I could come up with that might, might work as a, uh, a book that I'd want to do. A narrative to pull everything together. Yeah. And they wanted to do Palestine because of the hotness of that area. And you're like, oh, I didn't go to a place that's dangerous enough. Next time I'll go to Syria. (laughs) So you're just basically looking for a thread to kind of pull all of this together. Yeah. And then I kind of thought about it and then started coming up with a few ideas that would mean I could uh, tie some travel in and kind of see some places. And that's where the street art of from cities around the world came in. And we pitched that, I pitched that to them and they accepted it and uh, offered me an advance and I was like, cool. And Um, then you're off. Then, yeah. Then then, you're off and running. Then it was next stop Cairo. Wow. Yeah, that was sweet. And so from doing this, you're now not only capturing the way these different environments look, like Los Angeles to London to Palestine Mm -hmm. to Cairo, but you're also capturing the unique you know, you got the the landscape, which is the architecture mm. in this instance, but then there's the unique thumbprint or the culture of the city, which is the street art. Yes. And do you feel yeah. any conflict about putting other people's, your version of other people's artwork in your book? That is something I have felt conflicted about. Yeah. Um, and if, if it wasn't such a large collection of work, um, with my thoughts and kind of uh, observations of each place, I think I would maybe feel like, I don't know, like I was profiting off someone else's artwork. Directly. If it was like one piece, you'd feel that way, but because it's so much of a collection. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. Um, And I think it's okay to feel conflicted about it. Sure. Because I'm, also a human trying to make a living at what 
I think I'm good at. And so maybe profiting off someone else's creative work is okay. Um, or not okay. They can get mad at me. I can give them a print. I can, we can talk about it. Um, I think that it, I feel the same conflict. Mm. You and I got a lot in common. I feel the same conflict because to make my job work, it has to fade down at an hour. You know what I mean? Like oh, yeah. pe most people will only be able to hear half of this conversation. And you know, people are like, you should sell, you know, individual episodes or packs. But I'm like, then it just looks too much like I'm direct profiting, mm -hmm. profiting off of sitting down and talking to Ed Templeton and Jim Phillips. If I were to do like a skateboard pack, yeah. you know, and, and uh, some of the other folks I've talked to in that world. But because they're in there with, you know, 500, 600 other interviews, it doesn't feel so bad. But I think that that conflict is a really great thing in your head because... Mm -hmm. You're creative. The last thing you want to do is take uh, advantage of another creative. So feeling that conflict and being aware of it creates a conflict resolution of how can I do this and be true to my brothers and sisters, but also true to my own project. Mm. And I find sometimes those conflicts are so much more in our own heads than anybody else's. But it, isn't it such a good feeling to be there and to thought about it versus being like, oh, I don't, I'm giving them free promotion, man. What, what's their fucking problem? It's like, all right. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I think it yeah, there is no no perfect solution and so it's yeah, as long as you're aware of it and okay if someone is a bit annoyed with you. Yeah. And okay to try and meet them and find some resolution. Right. I think yeah. I think that's okay. I'm just impressed because uh, some people would not feel that conflict. Mm -hmm. And to me that would be a real red flag of Yeah. How do you not see that, you know, that this book is based on other artists and other in b different places around the world? So you're out in the middle living this book right now. Yes. we got some deadlines coming up in the fall. <laughs> yeah. But right now in the spring, <laughs> we're just living the fucking book. The sun is shining. <laughs> how is my home turf of Southern California, Los Angeles, how is this going to stack up differently than the other landscapes in this book? Uh... The interesting thing about Los Angeles that I found that I've not found in any of the other cities. <laughs> keep talking. That's a okay. phone line I only have for prank phone calls. <laughs> okay. keep, keep talking. Uh, that I've not seen in other cities is this. There is almost this conflict between the street artists and the graffiti writers. Yes. And... This is something that I've not seen before. And so it's going to make some really interesting images where you've got half of a mural visible in the top and then the lower half is painted out and then got some graph over it or got a large kind of uh, large kind of, um, masterpiece at the bottom to prevent other people putting more throw ups on. Uh, and that is, yeah, that that obviously visible conflict was something I wasn't expecting and that I'm really excited about. There are a lot of uh, beautiful, I mean, fucking beautiful legal murals all over Southern California. Long Beach just had powwow here not too long ago. So we could hop in the car and we could cruise around and just see some amazing stuff that I really like that. I really enjoy because it's planned out. It's plotted. It changes the environment. It changes the landscape of where you're at. Mm -hmm. The throw up tags, I'm on the fence about. Yeah. Sometimes they're really, really well done. And I'm like, wow, it's amazing that somebody could just do that. And then other times they're disrespectful. They deface property and they make all artists, folks like you and I covered in tattoos that still dress like skateboarders, even though we're way too old too. <laughs> it makes all of us look like criminals. And it, and it, it breaks my heart when I see the shopkeep that has to replace a, a, a pane of glass because some fucking asshole walked by and put up something that you can't even read. At least if I could read it, I'd understand. Well, way to go, Fetto. But the fact that it's just like scribble, 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 long T, I have no idea. Like That's yeah. where my conflict lies with yeah. the graffiti. But why, why did he do that? Because he's an asshole. Hey friends, I hope you've enjoyed part one of today's adventure with your new friend, Lorna Brown. Don't forget, 
follow her artwork, her, her paintings and illustrations of, of urban landscapes over at Lorna Stration. That's on Instagram. That's the, the best way to follow everything that she's been up to. Hopefully you enjoyed part one. Part two, it gets even better. And, and we really deep dive into this whole experience of finding yourself, finding your freedom, leaning into the things that make you scared, uh, a lifelong passion of, of skateboarding, which at the end of the day, even though I don't like to say this, skateboarding basically is a thrill-seeking type sport. I don't, I don't want to think of myself as a Mountain Dew ad, but there is something about the idea that at any moment, the tiniest pebble can break your arm or Tony Hawk's. We're all just one tiny rock away from, from biting shit and eating a ton of asphalt. And Lorna really paints, I think, a beautiful picture of facing your fears, evaluating your life, and really putting your emotional goals at the forefront of what it is that you're trying to do, who you're trying to be. She went on this epic trip and then came home and had a very hard time looking at the life that she was living and making sense of it and really had to evaluate who do I want to be? How do I want to get there? And how do I learn to live in the present? I moved this interview up because it just was sort of hitting the spirit of where the show's been at recently, where, where I'm at recently having taken my trip and sort of doing a lot of self-evaluation. And I really think that this is a great message for anyone to hear. And I really wish, I don't know if this is what I'm supposed to say, but I don't give a fuck. I'll say it anyways. I really wish a lot of the young women in my life would have heard an interview like this going way back when, because I grew up around so many young women in, in the Kentucky, Southern Indiana area that for whatever reason, didn't give themselves permission to hop on that skateboard. They didn't give themselves permission to just go for it. For whatever reason, they felt contained. They felt trapped. They, they were what society told them they should be, not the person that they wanted to be. So if you've got a young lady in your life, I'm going to send this over to my niece. I think my sister will let it go through and let her see what Uncle Marky does for a living because I really feel like that this is an inspirational story of getting on that skateboard and just letting go and seeing where the world takes you. All right. Part two is available only for members of the Circle of Trust. Sign up today at Adventures in Dot Design. It gets you the second part of today's episode, all episodes, and unlocks our archive. We've got over 580 inspirational episodes recorded. Whatever you're trying to figure out, whatever you're trying to tackle, I'm sure we've talked about it with another creative that you'll come to learn, love, and respect. Let's jump into part two of Lorna Brown. Hey, Lorna, thank you for writing me the email. Thank you for bringing your story to the AID airwaves. You were right. You deserve to be on the show. No, it's because he wanted to be known. He wanted his name there. It's a game. It's it's his own quest. Yeah. And this is something that I didn't appreciate before I came on this kind of this adventure. Sure. Um, and so talking to a few different graffiti artists and muralists and uh, trying to get to the bottom of why because the reasons why are so varied across the world which Cairo was particularly interesting because it's so political yeah um and so trying to find out the whys to create the stories uh has been rather than just being attracted to the beautiful pieces and uh again going back to what we were talking about before profiting off the most beautiful pieces because I'm painting something that's beautiful. Actually, I'd rather tell the story of the the throw-ups on top of the really interesting image and how the there's a conversation going on between people that are never going to meet. Yeah. That's fascinating. I, I just, I see the guy that earns the big wall, you know, the mm -hmm. Tristan Eaton piece. I see that as a guy who has worked his ass off, got a lot of street credibility you know he, he's worked for that moment so to get the whole side of the building is an accomplishment to be that known or or scat one who lives right down the street from me mm -hmm. i see that as being an accomplishment but to walk by and to take to me i you know 
I come from that last generation of being afraid of the older kids. You know, when I started going to punk shows, I stood in the back. I wanted to learn how the older straight edge kids, how the older punk rock kids were doing it. I've always been like, you know, and it, even though there's not a, an official seniority, I've always wanted to pay respects to the older kids, learn how they did what they did and become accepted by them. Mm-hmm. The walking across and taking over a shopkeep's window and putting your name up there. Mm. I, I just, I can't, I can't vibe with it. I can't get behind it. Once mm-hmm. I was informed, like you should do a series of shows on graffiti. I'm like, I don't want to do graffiti. I don't mm-hmm. like graffiti. You know, I, I, I don't I like, I like the murals. I like the, the high end art aspect of it. I like yeah. the working hard and earning something. I don't like taking over a city. I, I, yeah. I, it, it rubs me the wrong way, even more so as an artist, because I feel like it sets everything back a little bit. You know, I feel like it's, those are the people in your neighborhood who are like, come on, man, just fucking mow your lawn because you're making all of us look like assholes. Yeah. And I guess sometimes we lump everyone. We kind of put a hierarchy that the tagger becomes, the throw up becomes, the masterpiece becomes a muralist. And actually yeah. the muralist is often a whole different. It's a different scene. Of, a different world. Yeah. And rarely the two cross. Uh, and yeah, I, I don't like looking at bad throw ups, but I find that the more you understand about anything, the more fascinating sure, it is. Sure. I, I talked to LA OG Man One, mm-hmm. who Man One's in a very unique position where he gets hired to do the giant walls. He does commercial stuff, but he also yeah. comes from the world doing the throw up. He explained it to me that the old culture like the OGs, the way that they did it, the way that he was raised and the way the rules you were supposed to adhere to was you can do throw ups and you can do tags on government buildings. Yeah. You don't do it to the private individual. Anything that the government owns, we all own and you can do it on the government because it's voiced not against the government, but you don't do it to the poor fucking Koreans that just moved to town that are just trying to give you a stir fry at affordable price, you know? <laughs> And yeah. I, when I when he broke it down to me that way, I was like, that fucking makes a ton of sense. And yeah. now I can get behind it. But then he did tell me that those rules after generation, generation get a little, you know, the telephone game. It gets a little bit misguided. Yeah. So I think a book like yours, not only with the beautiful, the paintings and sort of, you know, you've got a very unique thumbprint as an artist of the way you put personality in there. But there's also essays that mm-hmm. are going to accompany all this work. Right. So yes. what what is sort of, you know, when I look at three or four pieces for a region. How are you going to write that out in words? Like, is it a personal story while you're there? Is it about the work itself? Like what's the, what's the, what's the reading part going to be about? Oh, uh, words. Uh, the reading part, I think it's going to be uh, maybe a little bit like uh, a magazine article would be about each mm. collection. So treating each collection as an individual sure. essay. Um, and so, yeah, each city I've found so far, I've been trying to, have a a hook for it um and it will be partially travelogue what it was like in each city but then also what that threw up regarding uh this kind of weird quest that yeah. i'm on yeah so a bit of a document of what you're looking at and how it relates to the whole overall like is this i guess what i'm asking you am i going to be looking at sopranos where each episode leads into the next, or is this law and order where it gets wrapped up in 42 minutes every time? Uh, I don't know yet. <laughs> I'm going to have to write it. <laughs> I like your honesty, but Hey, we're talking to you right now while you're out living the book. Yeah. Which is fucking fascinating. You went, got an advance. Mm-hmm. Your bills are paid for your travels are paid for, and you're just out living the dream right now. Yeah. It's fucking great. It's, it's so great. And part of that came from, I don't know, when you live in London, you can feel like, oh, I've got to earn more and more money and I can't make these choices because they take me away from my earning potential. And The rat race. <laughs> hate it. And coming back from Palestine, I was, I was in a really dark place for a while because I felt like I did not engage with this desire to earn more money and push my right ugh, all of that stuff you gotten off the grid and yeah. when you came home the excess made you sick 
Exactly. Yeah. I struggle to relate to people. Yeah. I'm the person that makes you sick. I'm very materialistic. <laughs> That's cool. That's fine. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I struggle to relate to the life that I felt like I was meant to be living. Yeah. That I'd imposed on myself. Sure. From my own, I don't know, idea of uh, kind of what's good for the future. And um, like we'd spent years trying to get on top of things. And I kind of flipped everything on its head and realized that by running and putting so much energy in trying to get on top of things in order to then live the life you want to live, how about I just live the life I want to live? and see where that takes me. And right now I'm in Long Beach and if I die tomorrow, this has been cool. Yeah. <laughs> I am no regrets. I can completely understand what you're saying because a friend of ours, he thought, well, if you own your own business, you make more money. More money will equal freedom and you can get to retirement faster. So he owned a merchandise company and he ran that for like four or five years. And then one day he realized that it was just going to be the same year every year. You pick up more bands, you print merchandise for them. It takes forever for them to pay you. You get stuck in the lows and highs of cash flow. When you got a lot of money, you spend it on things you don't really fucking mm -hmm. need. When you have no money, you wish you wouldn't have just spend money on things that you didn't <laughs> fucking need and that it would just go over and over and over again. So in a stroke of genius... He decides to thank you for listening to adventures in design podcast to hear part two of today's episode, visit adventures in dot design. Click where it says circle of trust and help support the only daily talk show designed for creative professionals, just like you. Thank you for listening. Good day and good design.